How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of your favorite swimbait podcast, Scales and Tails, episode 153. Today, we're joined by a gentleman from the West Coast. I feel like it's been a little while since we've talked to anybody from the West Coast. This will be uh, this will be nice. I've I've been wanting to get some more guys on from the West Coast, and uh, the next on my hit list, I think, is uh, Mr. Danny from Blank Date because I want to talk about uh, the Delta because Delta is crazy. I don't know anything about the Delta. I know it's a crazy thing with with sea lions and, and stuff that I've never had to worry about while bass fishing, so I got to hear their experiences about that. We were joined by Mister Chad Schweitzer. 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 Okay, dude, I, I underlined it. it. I'm like, I got to pronounce the e in the i. It's not Schweitzer like I thought it was, <laughs> but we're good. We're good. This is like the first time in a while that I've gotten a last name right, a challenging last name right. So I'm gonna pat myself on the back for that, but. Chad, I guess uh, give us a little introduction on you, and then uh, you know, we'll ask the standard how you got into fishing, then we'll do a deep dive into all the good stuff that everybody wants to hear tonight. Yeah, so it's a little bit about me. Literally been fishing my whole life. Uh, it was the first thing, first thing I ever did. Like I was born, and then my dad went home, took my mom and me home to get his bass tackle, and then they went to the we, they all went to the lake. That's so awesome. It's like literally like grew up bass fishing. And, uh, you know, my brothers did too, but they didn't really, you know, they're into downhill mountain biking, more adrenaline driven stuff. Yeah. But me, I've never, like never been tired of fishing. Never. Yeah. And so I've just been doing it my whole life. What, what's your first like memory from the fishing, whether it's you like catching your first fish or even just going out on the boat with your parents, what's that first memory for you? Um, I think the first like significant memory was uh I don't know how old I was maybe four years old maybe three but my dad he would he went out he left me but he went out on a inflatable pontoon boat mm -hmm. and caught like a eight and a half nine pounder Dang. and I was just completely blown away by how big that fish was <laughs> and I still remember that very clearly that is so cool that's so cool so when was your first experience like actually getting to cast or catch your first fish or whatever else it may be when did your kind of dad kind of give you the rod and reel and show you everything and kind of set it all up for you oh gosh before I can remember oh really um, dang oh yeah like I mean I was just always on the boat it, you know it's different when you just never get tired of it he every every time unless I was sick I do remember getting sick on the water a few times just being miserable yeah. but unless I was sick like he'd have to drag me off even like three or four years old. Um, gosh, the first fish I actually remember catching. I, I can't even think of it. It's I'm, I know it's on my grandma's pond. They have a right. pond that like private boat launch um, that I used to spend hours before <laughs> when I was too young to like drive and back yeah. down a boat, I would steer and my grandma would do the gas and the brake. <laughs> and so like, I would be outside the car, like try to steer the boat backwards to put it in the water. <laughs> oh, it's funny, dude. What, um, what's your first like memorable fish that you remember catching, whether it was like one you were super proud of or like your biggest to a certain point. Yeah, that I remember this one. Um, gosh, I'm, I don't know. I was maybe 10 years old. I wasn't super young, mm -hmm. but I had never caught like a big fish. I would always like go up to, we, we mounted my dad's uh, nine pounder mm -hmm. and I would always go up and like lip it yeah. and you just feel the meat. Like right. it's different than lipping a two pounder. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was probably like 10 years old and I hooked like a five and a half pounder on a jig mm -hmm. and like cranked it in, boat flipped it, snapped the rod. But like I grabbed it and I was like, Oh yes. Like it's got that meat on it. You can feel like that. That's a big fish. Yeah. That was, that was a fun one. Saw it, hit the jig, and I'll always remember that one. Dude, I will say 10 years old and fishing a jig, like, that's – I'm I'm 23, and I don't even like fishing jigs, and I don't even think I do it good. So <laughs> that's a testament to say something, like, literally being raised on the water, by the water, that you were fishing a jig and, and catch – obviously caught, like, good fish while doing it at such a young age. I mean, I feel like a lot of guys 10 years old, maybe they're, you know – catching bluegill and stuff but if they're into bass fishing they're catching them on like a senko or, or something i don't know i feel like a jig is pretty pretty technically inv advanced for for a 10 year old kid that that's that's like crazy to hear yeah like just looking back there's one uh I'm, I'm sure you've never heard of it but it's called henry co 
And every weekend they'd open it up and you'd hike six miles in mm -hmm. to these just untouched farm ponds. Wow. And, you know, from like six to 10 years old, we, it was, you know, float tubes only. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just sit out there, you know, 10 hours a day, just by myself, you know, experimenting and would, no matter what you threw, obviously you'd catch fish. Right. Cause yeah. it's an untouched farm pond. Yeah. And so that's where I was able to develop like, Oh, how do you throw a jig? And you just go and catch 50 fish on a jig yeah. and learn how to do it. And so that was, you know, just being able to catch fish on whatever you wanted was super important in my development. Yeah, dude, that's like, that's how I got so confident with a wacky rig and a, a fluke. Like I could catch a fish any style rig on a fluke. And that's because I grew up fishing a farm pond where it was a white zoom fluke and you just would hammer fish on it. And I always say that like, if you have confidence in a bait, the fish just don't know a difference. They just, it feels like you fish so much better when you have confidence in a bait and like the fish just know you have confidence. So they eat the bait. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Like I've talked about it where guys who are super big into weight fishing or wake bait fishing, try to pick up a glide and they have no confidence. Yeah. They're like, this is the stupidest thing ever. And then, you know, they get a little bit of confidence in it, you know, three weeks later, they can't set the glide down because they're like, Oh, I just know the fish are going to eat this. And it's like, it's kind of a mindset thing where your, your brain's just telling you, Oh yeah, you know how to fish this and you're, you're confident in it. You're just going to keep casting because you know, you're going to come across at least one fish that'll eat it. It's kind of crazy how it works. Yeah. And once you start throwing something, you start recognizing like, like, even if you're just throwing a glide bait, you're throwing a glide bait down this whole bank you know, there's maybe three or four spots where that's a glide spot. Mm -hmm. And then maybe there's three other different spots where it's a wake bait spot. Mm -hmm. And so the same, you know, the same area will have three different, you know, two different styles of areas yeah. that those, those, that wake bait guy and that glide bait guy are going to catch fish, mm -hmm. but just on different structure on the same bank. Yeah. yeah it's kind of crazy how it all works. So you said, were you fishing out of a float tube around that like six to 10 years old? Oh yeah. Wow. See, I got, like I mean, my dad got his bass boat when I was like 16 or 17. Okay. So it was all float tube and pontoon boat mm -hmm. and kayak for my, for the pond at my grandma's house. My okay. grandpa had a John boat, okay. spent a lot of time in that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the whole beginning of my fishing was all, all uh, never out of a bass boat. Okay. So dude, it's crazy. Like guys, like people that, uh, are a little bit younger than me like they they think it's foreign to see a float tube like it's starting to be more common yeah. to see paddle boards like people don't bat an eye at somebody fishing off a paddle board but you see like a instagram reel or like a youtube short or whatever it is and people are like what the hell is that thing and it's a float yep. tube and it's kind of i don't know it's kind of weird i it, it's not a popular thing here in like in Michigan, but I mean, I know what it is. I've seen countless videos of guys doing it in pictures and stuff. And I know it's super big in California and it's just kind of weird how, like how the float tube used to be like super top tier. And now the paddleboard is up there and the float tube is kind of like the ugly stepchild that people think is weird for whatever reason, or they can't wrap their mind around it or something. Yeah. And in my opinion, it's the best way to catch fish. Like, I mean, I have a, I have a bass boat, mm -hmm. but I mean, I caught my first double digit out of a float tube. Whoa, my dad really? caught his 17 out of a float tube. Oh my gosh. And because you're, it's, you're completely silent. Yeah. You're casting low, low to the water, quiet entry. Wow. It's just, you know, you can't see them, but I love fishing out of a float tube. That's crazy. I know, uh, Zaldane has like a 13 out of a float tube. I mean, I know there's a lot of guys who catch a lot of big fish off the float tube and it, it's kind of weird how like the times have changed, how like the float tube is kind of the weird thing now. Yeah. It's easy I, to fight them too out of the float tube. You can spin because right. you got full control because mm -hmm. you got the fins. Yeah. You just you spin circles around and you just grab them because you're already in the water. Yeah. They're, they're pretty, I, I will, I, I'll back up and say they're kind of, um, not common here, but you do see them every once in a while here because the fly fishing and like the rivers and on the lakes yeah. and stuff guys will do it like they'll sell them at like dunham's and stuff but dude i think i could probably count on like one hand how many times i've seen guys like buy them from the store like load them up like it's it's like not really common here it, the common thing are you familiar with like the stealth crafts it's like a big uh like a fly fishing style it's like a hard oh, inflatable yeah, yeah. dinghy essentially that's like what's really popular here like everybody has a stealth craft because the river fishing is like so popular and the paddleboard stuff is like not even a thing here. Like guys will see me pumping up a paddleboard and they have no idea what I'm doing. It's just like kayaks 
bass boats and bass boats are even kind of hit or miss and then uh, the like stealth craft stuff and it's it's a really uh really interesting like looking at your guys' style of fishing and like what you would see daily out on the lake and then turn around and see what you would see here it's 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 kind of interesting and i will say like yeah, i i had gone sure. to lake fork in the in last spring and like i have never seen that many bass boats before and like my girlfriend she's really not into <laughs> fishing she's not really into fishing and i was we were like going down the road like around lake fork and every gas station you know bass cat tritons just everything icons and i was i was just like awestruck and my girlfriend's like what and she's like we have like you see boats like this at home but i'm like i've never seen 500 bass boats at 10 gas stations before like that is the craziest thing i've ever seen like it was a culture shock i'm like i d i did not believe that and they're all have like f350s and 3500 chevys and dualies and stuff yeah. and like i'm just like you <laughs> up here it's like you either have a nice boat or a nice pole truck, or you have a decent of both. You don't have, you, you don't see somebody driving with $200,000 truck and a $125,000 bass. Well, it's just not a thing around here. Yep. Yeah, that's, it's always funny to see, like, you see what the guy values more. Either yeah, he has yeah. like the really nice truck and then just a beater boat. <laughs> or then like me, I've got a 2019 Bass Cat Cougar, mm -hmm. but my, uh, my truck is a 2004 F-150. <laughs> Yeah. so my boat's worth so much more than my truck but Man, I've, that's how I've i'd seen, like i've seen some absolute crazy stuff like i i kid you not like like 1990 dodges that are just up here we have all that salt so their bed their wheel wells are just absolutely gone the bed is pretty much just there for looks it's held it's held together by a ratchet strap so it's got tension <laughs> and they're pulling like they're pulling like a 2017 nitro or and even like even like a nitro isn't necessarily a crazy crazy expensive boat but it's just like wow and like it's all polished and they're wiping it down at the boat ramp and i'm just yeah. like you guys <laughs> you guys got your priorities figured out that's, that's what i'll say about that exactly <laughs> oh man that's awesome so after after you like catch catch this five and a half pounder on the jig about 10 years old after that was it just kind of sticking with the sticking with the whole bass fishing thing and like catching good fish up until a certain point and then what what uh I guess we'll go from when you were 10 to about the time you got into swim baits or learned about swim baits. We'll, we'll cover that whole, whole section right now. Yeah. I, I mean, I got into tournament fishing when I was 13 fishing the California Delta um, fishing tournaments there. And it was always, you know, I'd always keep tabs on the, the tournaments around my home lakes and the fish that I was catching on the jigs on the worms and stuff never even got me close to a leading bag wow. you know i'd always try to yeah i'd go out and compete and i was like what do i need to do to catch bigger fish mm -hmm. and so that's when i started looking at the swim baits dude tournament fishing at 13 and and mind you tournament fishing here at 13 in the middle of bfe michigan is way different <laughs> than what you're doing out at the delta like out of the delta you're fishing grown man tournaments like here we have Wednesday nighters and then we have the quote unquote I like to call them the big boy tournaments and the big boy tournaments have like 20 or 30 boats and it's like KVD and his family and some other like local hammers and that's what I consider a big boy tournament but I mean for you a big boy tournament is probably like 60 or 70 boats like just absolutely crazy at, at the age of 13 fishing tournaments like that yeah yeah I didn't they I would do like amateur tournaments they were not you know I didn't jump into the pro-ams until I was, you know, in college mm -hmm. and fishing the college tour tournaments. And even then, you know, I was doing them out of the bass tracker. Yeah. And so this next year, now that I have a big boy, big boy boat, I will be doing the pro-ams, but oh, really cool. this, this next year is going to be my first year getting really serious into it. Yeah. yeah. So Michigan has um, like its own trail, essentially. It's just like, uh, it's like the association and then there's a bunch of like regional tournaments and stuff. And I live... I, I'm, I'm moving back where I previously lived. I'm about like three hours from where KVD calls home. And I mean, you'd be fishing a Wednesday, you'd be fishing like a Wednesday morning or like a Thursday morning and you'd see him dump his boat in and he'd be pre-fishing for the big, you know, the quote unquote big regional tournament coming up. And that's just, that's I, was awesome. like, I was like, dang, like yesterday, yesterday, I think it was eight years ago to the, to the day I was out fishing one of my spots and uh, Jonathan Van Dam, Kevin's nephew was like trying to drop shot this spot and I come out there with an S waiver and I caught like three or four fish. And I, he like looked at me, he was like awestruck. He wasn't catching anything all day. And he ended up motoring away. 
And a couple of years later, um, I met a kid that worked with him. And he's like, dude, he still talks about that, that this random kid just came out there with this big old swim bait and just started <laughs> catching all these fish. And uh, I, t I texted him awesome. about it. I texted him about it yesterday. The guy's like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to get you Jonathan's phone number so you can send him that every year and make fun of him for it. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. It, it, it's it's crazy. And it's kind of crazy how like I know this whole time we've been talking about it, but like the cultural difference bass fishing has here to whereas where you are to the south like or texas even like it's crazy how like a couple thousand miles even a couple hundred miles at some points in time and it's just completely a different game yeah i i fished the Bassmaster college national championship in 2017 okay. and that was in bemidji minnesota mm -hmm. and uh i left like i left my depths 250 at home left the like 10 inch hud yeah. at home but I did bring a six inch S waiver. Okay. And I had it on deck and the guys there were like, what is that? That is the most ridiculous thing. It was just a six inch. It was the little yeah. S waiver. Yeah. But I was like, oh, I should have brought the depth 250 just to put it on deck just yeah. so they could look at it. <laughs> That's what I would do. And Wednesday nighters, I would pull up and I'd have like my ghost tied on. I'd have a big old 10 inch mag draft tied on and guys like it was all local guys. So they knew what I was doing. And they knew where I was going to fish because everybody had heard about it. Everybody had seen me fishing while they were pre-fishing for other tournaments. And so guys, guys knew that I wasn't messing around. They knew I was actually going to fish that stuff, but that was always super cool. So 2017, you're fishing in college. So that's like around the time the mag draft was the hot bait to get. The six inch mag draft was like what all the college guys wanted for like Kentucky Lake and, and all those, all those tournaments. I like, so I'm familiar I'm not too sure. Are you from, were you, like, did you ever fish against like the West Virginia guys or ever hear about the West Virginia guys like Nolan Minor? Uh, uh, Nolan? Yeah. Nolan. Yeah. Nolan. I, we fished, we he, they did well in that tournament. Okay. I think, yeah. <clears throat> but we would fish next to each other in the Mississippi River. Nolan and, and like, yeah. Just cross paths and talk. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I've actually, we parked next to them in the 2018 national championship morning of blast off. Okay. And just so, yeah, kind of like talk that to him. Was, He's such a friendly guy. Yeah, dude, he is so nice. So I was two years or it must have been like my sophomore year, sophomore junior year. And I was like, I was like really wanted to go to college to fish. I talked to Nolan. I talked to a bunch of guys. And that was the point in time that Adrian College was like really starting to make a name for itself, like the second year. Yep. And that was like when Bethel was like kicking butt. And that's like I was like at that point in time, I was like, oh, yeah. I want to go to school. I want to bass fish. I don't know where I want to go to school or what I want to go to school for. I just know I want to go to bass fish. And like, I, I yeah. thought about it for a long, long time. And I was just like, you know, if I'm paying to go to school, I need to go to school and I don't need to worry about the whole bass fishing part of it. And it was, I was just like, if I go and I get onto a club or a team, I'm, I'm not going to go to school. I am going to worry about tournament fishing. And I was like, it's probably for the best that I just, I don't even entertain that thought. But like, I talked to Casey and Nolan a lot because that was the year, yep. I think 2018 might've been the year that, uh, Nolan had made that, made the championship round for that, uh, it was like an MFL style tournament and like he won with, or he lost with like a minute 30 left. The other guy caught like a Sanko fish to put him over the, put him over the weight to win or something like that. I think that was 2019. Okay. okay. I want to say, I think 2017 and 2018, I fit, I fished it and mm -hmm. he did too. Okay. I didn't make it in 2019. And I think that's what I was watching that live rooting yeah. for him. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Heartbreaker. It was like that. that was I remember like, that. That was the most in depth I had ever gotten into like the tournament wow. stuff because dude at that point in time like you're seeing guys like on the elite series now but like there was just so many good guys in college at that point in time like and it wasn't yeah. necessarily live stream but like watching weigh-ins watching all their instagram stories and stuff i mean that was the year or that was like around the time that kentucky lake was just vicious and like adrian sunk two boats and like ripped lower units off there was a like bethel i think sunk a boat out there on their home water at that point in time like Dude, that like that was like the pinnacle of college bass fishing. I don't keep up with it anymore, but like that was that was the time to to be intrigued by college bass fishing. And that was like that probably would have cost me a lot of money if I ended up following following up with the idea or like the dream I had to go fish in college. <laughs> yeah, I college fishing was that was a super fun experience. I'm so glad I did it. But yeah, most of my time in college was spent worrying about fishing, not yeah. school. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah like I was like oh man I just I can't do it but like at that point in time I don't think Michigan had really had like a big college circuit so like if you wanted to fish in Michigan for college you were going to travel to the Kentucky lakes down to Florida wherever else and now like excuse me Michigan has like our own like circuit so like you can just stay in state and fish and I was like well heck if that was a thing when I first like it happened like two or three years out of high school I was like well if that happened while I was in high school that probably would have been a little bit better of a decision for me if I wanted to go end up doing that but oh well talking about the Uncle Rico days talking about throwing a football over a hill from 10 years ago but exactly that was um (laughs) it's cool that you were like in it at that point in time because like I said that was just such a I mean, there's times that I would sit in like social studies class and like world history and I would be updating the Bassmaster tracker because I wanted to see what everybody was doing. And I'd watch all the Instagram stories and I'm just like, wow, reading all the articles and everything. But that's so awesome. At that point in time, I don't even think they probably still do it, but uh, Bass had had a college um, Snapchat account. And they would give people the logins to like log their days. Dude, I remember watching that stuff all the time. It was like, oh, hey, you know, so-and-so from this college, uh, we're out here on Blank Lake and this is what we're going to try to do today. And I, dude, I thought that was the coolest thing. I was like, wow, like that, that was like ahead of its time. Like that was, that was cool before it was cool to do something like that. I remember being on that during practice, trying to figure stuff out. (laughs) (laughs) Just see how are they catching fish? <laughs> oh man, that's so awesome. So I guess you had mentioned that you were you had had some swim baits around like that 2017 timeline. Did you while you were like younger, that 13 years old, were you getting into swim baits or like kind of hearing about swim baits being out on the delta at that time? Yeah, I like when I look back at it, always loved throwing swim baits. Mm-hmm. Never had success with them. Really? Like you hear the stories about the guys like, oh, I picked up a Huddleston and first trip out. Yeah. Like, no, I threw, it was the old Castaics, hmm. uh, like the three jointed ones that swam like super hard. They turned super hard. And I threw that thing for hours. I threw the Huddleston. I still have like hundreds of hours on a Huddleston and like a few fish up to right. six, seven pounds, eight pounds, but nothing really meaningful but i it the swim bait deal there was no like it was never like a light switch like oh this is awesome it was all it was just kind of a slow progression as i learned more and more yeah and so like the time you were doing it like what was it like uh mid 2010s probably or like early 2010s yeah prime time in california yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like the fish had seen stuff, but they weren't like crazy used to it. And and it's not, but also you weren't fishing virgin waters. Like, I think that's why I got so hooked on it because my fish had never seen anything like this before and they still hardly do. And I think that's like why my draw to it was so strong because I went out and I was like, holy crap, I caught fish on this crazy bait. And then I just spiraled to buying crazier baits and I kept catching fish on it. And there was just no bound or limit to it. Whereas it sounds like you kind of had to cut your teeth a little bit more and, and mess around with, with like the time and gaining confidence in it. Mine was just like, just add water. And I kind of lucked into it essentially. Yeah. I think that like, if someone was trying to get into swim baiting, trying to find that pond that they've never seen it before, just to gain confidence. Cause really that's what it took when I, when I look back, my first 10 pounder was on a swim bait and that was like freshman year of college. Okay. And I had, it was a pond where nobody really threw them. And I actually went, my girlfriend was like, Hey, I'm going to go see my aunt and she lives on a lake. And I was like, cool. Are they fishing it? And she's like, I probably not. I was (laughs) like, all right, I'll just bring a S waiver and cast it around. And I brought an S waiver and a jig and I had 35 pounds for five fish and a 10 pounder with a lake that had <laughs> I was fish. like oh yeah there there are fish in here <laughs> that's crazy just nobody nobody thinks that there is man was that in california yeah yeah that was in like northern untouched, california I untouched actually, pond in california or lake in california well, it was private they wouldn't let oh. you launch a boat i took a float to okay okay dude just again that's another if you guys are keeping track that's like four pros to the pro float tube so far we're at no cons yet the only con i can think of is if you get blown <laughs> across the lake that's the only thing <laughs> Yeah, or put a hook in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So 
you're cutting your teeth with the swim baits and stuff and you're like did you see see him on the decks of other guys boats or like you know hear guys like oh i caught this eight like my kicker on a huddleston or, or whatever else at that time a triple trout maybe or something yeah, I think freshman year is right when I got Instagram mm -hmm. and I started like looking at Northern California guys pages and just seeing these massive limits of fish on the swim baits Yeah, and just being like, I've thrown, I know where those guys are fishing. Mm -hmm. I've thrown swim baits there. I, I, what am I doing wrong? Right. And it, I really wasn't doing anything wrong. I just wasn't doing it enough. Mm -hmm. Like once I threw everything else out of the boat, and would spend eight hours then you'd get one or two bites and then you you know it progresses yeah that's so crazy i will say growing up in california you might be a little too young to remember but like do you remember hearing hearing these guys catching these fish out on dixon lake in castaic and just thinking like wow that is so crazy really i just remember reading the bassmaster articles about it <laughs> and you know those bassmaster articles are always like pretty well behind the curve yeah. Yeah. for when it's actually happening six months too. but late. uh yeah exactly i i always stayed you know other than bassmaster and you know occasional online research mm -hmm. i wasn't on the forums or social media until college okay did you ever hear about butch or like mike long or any well probably mike long but maybe butch not until uh, 2018 okay that's what pretty I recent wow <clears throat> See, that's like, I don't know, it's kind of crazy how guys on like the East Coast knew about Butch, whatever else, and like a guy, you know, in the same state, you know, essentially just, just had never heard of him, never run across him, never seen anything from him. I mean, that's kind of crazy to think, like, that's just a, that's just a, uh, like a spokesman to how crazy the internet is. Yeah. Yeah. And California is such a big state, especially if you're not like, as much as I love to like go fishing and really that's all I did. I didn't, wasn't really involved in, you know, clubs or anything like that. I just fished and did my own thing. So getting on the forums really opened up to, you know, the national scene and even just the full California swim bait scene. Right. Yeah. So you get on the forums and you see these guys that are catching fish at maybe your home lake or some lakes that you're familiar with where you just did you kind of like do a reset and you're like, okay, I got to kind of relearn everything I know about the swim baits and kind of just reteach myself and, and figure out these waters a little bit differently than I'm used to. I tried. Um, and even like some of my success, like the, the Shasta record was in a college tournament three weeks after I caught the 10 pounder. Mm -hmm. And even that was kind of a, I mean, I was doing like everything right now looking yeah. back at it. But, you know, I did, I haven't, I still haven't really repeated that pattern. Um, it was just, it, I took the same bait. It was an S waiver, the same S waiver that I caught the, uh, the 10 pounder on at the pond, uh, just a rainbow trout. I took it to Shasta and in practice, I was just catching, you know, three pounders and three pounders at Shasta are gold. Right. Cause you're, you're looking at, you know, 12 pounds is a great limit mm -hmm. and day one, I was like, all right, I'm just grinding the S waiver day one. It was cloudy and it was, it hadn't been cloudy in practice. Mm -hmm. And so through the S waiver, nothing, we ended, we were in last place day one. And then day two, we get the same sun that we had in practice and we had 18 pounds, including the 963 yeah. spotted bass. Dude. And that was all on the S waiver. That, so we'll say spotted bass, they're kind of like smallmouth, right? Like they're super ferocious, but they don't, they just hit like a cap space and they get, they get a certain length and then they just kind of start to get fat after a while. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, they're exactly. crazy ferocious, right? Like they just smack whatever comes swimming past them. Yeah. They're pretty like, I've seen a few in that nine to 11 pound range and they are, they're hard to get to like, to get them to turn a switch. Mm -hmm. But when you do like this one, I, it was a submerged tree and I was kind of up shallow and the tree was facing directly out. Yeah. And I was just walking the S waiver over the top. And I was like, Oh my gosh, look at that carp. Cause you know, you're not thinking, <laughs> you know, close to double digit fish at Shasta. And then we both go up. I was like, Oh my gosh, it's a spotted bass. And 
at that point, you know, I've had countless followers. Mm-hmm. Once they get that close to the boat, the odds of you turning them are so yeah. slim. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Bad luck. And while I was saying that, it just came up and crushed it. And Whoa. <laughs> it was right over the tree. And immediately, you know, it tried to get back in the tree. Yeah. And I was throwing, I was throwing 20 pound fluoro, but to a braid. Mm-hmm. It's like 30 pound braid. Yeah. And I just put both thumbs on the spool. On the spool. <laughs> and just like just try not to like just hope it doesn't break. Oh my God. And dude. so once once I got it turned, you know, he netted it. All both the trebles were just completely mangled. Is 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 the shots are like super clear? Oh yeah. So crystal dude, clear. When you hook a big fish on like a big glide bait and it eats like right at your feet or it gets right to your feet, and you look down and that fish is on like a 70 degree angle swimming down and your rod and you can hear the line go, Arr! dude, that is ooh, that's like nightmare fuel right there. I can't tell you how many times I've gone, I've like been grinding a fish in. And I get it like within the next like 10 feet and then they just get a second wave and they just shoot down and you're like, oh crap, oh, yeah. like that is, that's scary. And the fact that it ate right at the boat, like you, it it eats right at the boat. Do you just like set the hook like a jig, like straight up? Or did you just like reel down into it or kind of, how did you, how did you play that? I think it was just kind of like a, cause it, it ate and immediately tried to go back oh, down. So, it was, it was so there was no like yeah. hook set. It was just like, oh, hang on, both thumbs on the spool. Just so I was like, this line's probably gonna break, but if I don't stop it, it's just gonna hang me in a tree. So yeah, the line held. Yeah. Dude, that is crazy. So you get this, you get this fish netted or boated. What was that? Your guys' like first keeper or like one of your first fish, or maybe towards the end of the day? We had a small limit. We had a small limit, like the same last place limit that we had the day before. And so when we got that fish in the boat. We, we were yelling for like three minutes. We, we yelled loud enough that someone came over and they're like, are you okay? And we held up the fish and he's like, oh, that nice. like, oh, that's why you're yelling. Dude, we that were is yelling crazy. for so long. That is so awesome. Was uh, this like, was this towards the end of the day? Like the end of the tournament? Uh, It was probably like 1230. Okay. And so we were doing it three. Whenever I like... I am notorious for catching a big fish in a tournament and I'm just like, dude, I'm just like not burnt out. It's not the right word, but I just like sit on the deck and I'm just like, I don't even know if I could take another cast. Like I cannot believe I just pulled that off. And that's like, if I did something like that, like if I was the fish college tournament and I kept, if I call it like my PB, like a seven or an eight, dude, I, that, that would probably screw me over. I'd probably be no use the rest of the day. And that's like, man, that's crazy. What was like, I guess when, when people fish certain bodies of water or like state record, like everybody kind of seems to have the state record, like in the back of their head, they know like that one fish that they need to catch to, to put their name on the map. Were you familiar with like the, the lake record or the state record or anything? Like, did you know that that was a special fish at the time? Yeah. Oh, well, we knew the world record was like, I think at that time it was a mid 10. Mm -hmm. And so actually the first thing I said when I hooked it was, oh my gosh, this is a world record. Yeah, because I, I thought it was, you know, right. flash underwater. I I thought it was a ten pounder, which nine and, and a half. And we got it in. Longer, there's really not that big of a difference between the two as far as like looks, like in the water and stuff. So I I probably would have said the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and it's like first thing I did was put it on a scale, and mm-hmm. it was like it said nine pounds ten ounces, mm-hmm. and so we knew it wasn't like in the world record. Right. So we kind of at that point we just boxed it, and really our mindset was okay, we had the smallest limit yesterday. Yeah. We have a small limit today, but then we caught a giant. Mm -hmm. It just looks like we got lucky. Yeah. So we're like, we have to get more. And then my partner, Tyler, Mm -hmm. ended up catching another like three and a half pounder Mm -hmm. on a crankbait. And so that day we probably had the two biggest fish. Right. And school uh, or uh, spotted bass, are they kind of like, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong fish here. They're like, form up in like schools and like you can turn a school on and they just they just go crazy right yeah the big ones not so much like you're not going to turn on well sometimes you can but it's rare to turn on like a bunch of big ones but you can sit you can spot lock and catch 30 of them that wasn't that wasn't our pattern we were running bank parallel yeah but yeah spotted bass school up big time Okay. Was there anybody else that's, that was fishing swim baits at that, like at that tournament for, for these bodies? Uh, Jacob wall. Okay. Do you, do you uh, recognize that name? 
that name sounds familiar for whatever reason. He's fishing the he's fishing the Bass Pro Tour. Okay, okay. And so he he was he had like seventeen pounds the first day. Wow. And yeah, like and he had one over five. Uh, and then so it was us two. We were after day two where we had the big bag. Really, it was just a shootout between the two of us. Jacob Wall, he was fishing solo. And uh, me and my partner. That's great. But yeah, he he threw me uh, at the end of the third day. He threw me like basically the same bait that I was throwing. He's like, oh, this is what I've been catching on. And I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, he knows what's up. Man, that's awesome. So <clears throat> you guys get in, you trail the boat or you, you beach the boat, dock the boat, whatever. And you're going into weigh in. Like, did did you post like post about it anywhere? Or like, had anybody heard about it outside of the people that were around you? Or was it just like, go up there? Oh, yeah, how'd you guys do? Oh, we did pretty good. And then just drop a 20 pound bag on him with a, with a nine and a half pound kicker. I, I pulled it out once to show someone and it was peeing so much water. I put it straight back down. Cause I was like, yeah. I do not want it to lose weight. I want it to stay as big as possible. Yeah. So yeah, we were talking like during way in or yeah, as we moved up and stuff, but we didn't really show too many people to fish that guy that came over to see us mm -hmm. went in, he was fishing the tournament that weighed in before us. Okay. And so he told the guy, oh, he's like, these kids have a, like an absolute giant. And even, uh, there was a guy, I think his name is Bryson. He weighed like a high eight in the tournament, like an hour that weighed in an hour before us. Imagine coming in with a nine and an eight, like in the same bag. You could, you'd probably wouldn't just I, to fish by the sounds of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I think after three days we had like low thirties, mm -hmm. mid thirties, so, but I mean, I don't know if you've seen the footage of Alex Niapis. How he had a 35 pound bag there. Wow. If you haven't seen that footage, you, you have to go find it. Was that from Shasta wild west? What was that? was that? Was that from this year? Cause I feel like, no, that was a couple years ago. Okay. I feel like I'd seen something with somebody catching a lot of big fish out there this year but I, I can't remember. Like, it was like in a tournament. I don't know if it was a YouTube video or something, but I heard rumblings of it. Yeah. You've got to, you, you got to go find that footage because he okay. catches a 13 pounder, a uh, large mouth. And then he like casts again and catches an eight pound spot is ridiculous. Oh my gosh. 21 pounds, just in a matter of a couple casts. That's crazy. So did you, yeah. I would, I would assume it's probably safe to assume that you won big bass for that weekend or that tournament. Oh yeah, that's actually I'm pretty sure it still stands as the biggest spotted bass ever caught in a Bassmaster tournament. Oh really? Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. And that's the that's the lake record too, right? Yes, I think it's the biggest spotted bass out of Shasta that has been officially put to a scale. Mm -hmm. I've seen 10 pounders there. I'm I'm willing to bet guys have caught 10 pounders there and they just put it back quietly because they're going for a world record. Right. But that's the biggest one I've seen like put to a scale. I would guess the world record will probably come out of there when somebody catches it and, and certifies it. There's like, I mean, the spotted bass fishing has gone way downhill as they overpopulate, but I've seen world record class spots in three different lakes. Wow. And there's like four or five other lakes that can probably produce a world record. So it's like, it's, it's almost just a matter of time until somebody stumbles upon that fish or that fish stumbles upon a bait to eat. Oh yeah. I had one that was, you know, easy, easy nine, definitely over nine. I actually, I was on a crazy pattern, 20 plus pounds of spots on just the same cast down the line. And I set the hook and I'm reeling in like what I thought was a real small fish. And then I get to the boat, it gets to the boat and it's like nine or 10 pound spot. And right as it turns, it does that, you know, the exact thing that you mentioned, that 70 degree down cut yeah, yeah. and it comes off and I'm like, oh my gosh, I throw the rod down. But on like on my swim jig is what I was throwing was a 13 inch red eye bass. Oh so the, the spot came up and was eating the fish that I was reeling yeah. in. Whoa, <laughs> that's crazy. That's, that's insane, yeah. man. That's so awesome. So were you, I guess, just kind of to hear some backstory, were you fishing that S waiver simply to try to 
upgrade your bites and try to keep maybe those like one, two pound, three pounders off and maybe go after the three, three and a half and higher. Exactly. Cause I was still catching, you know, we only needed five fish mm -hmm. and I was still catching like seven to eight fish a day on it. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I was getting a limit and you know, you had that chance at a big one. That's why I was throwing it. Dang. Did you, did you get to do a write up or anything for like Bassmaster or anything cool like that? Yeah, it did. A, I got an article in the Bass Times mm -hmm. and then I did a radio interview for Bass Radio. Oh, that's cool, dude. That's cool. So what year did you say that was? That was 2017. 2017. Okay. Okay. So after that, were you kind of, or I guess even at that point in time, were you pretty sold on the, like the idea of swim baits and like they have their time in place to like catch a truly, you know, high caliber fish? Oh yeah. Cause like that was a three week stretch where I had my PB, my first double digit and the nine pound spot. And then, you know, that really got me into the rabbit hole of getting on swim bait underground and starting to experiment. I bought my first depths 250 a little after that. And really just the S waiver and the depths 250 are what I ran with for a long time. What, uh, what rod were you fishing your S waiver on at that point in time? So <laughs> you're going to laugh. I caught the 10 pounder. It was on an I-Rod Bailey swim, which is like an 806. Yeah. Huge rod. And I was throwing it on 65 pound braid to 25 pound mono. <laughs> Just absolute massive combo and then for the spotted bass lake i dialed it down i was just throwing it on a crankbait rod because th those hooks on a 168 are just crankbait hooks yeah and dude they are some meaty hooks too like they are some vicious oh, looking hooks. i switched those out immediately <laughs> yeah dude they are some gnarly gnarly hooks uh it's funny that you you said like what side of the spectrum you were on like the super heavy stuff because I talked about it before my my first um combo was a KVD 69 jerk bait rod, a quantum jerk bait rod with a um, yeah, with a uh the step up from the black max, like the silver not the silver max. Dude, it was it was a crazy yeah, setup. 65 pound braid, straight 65 pound braid. And I'm oh, fishing oh. in like 40 foot visibility water, but it caught me fish because these fish had no idea what the hell they were seeing or what they were biting. So Yep. Um, I soon realized that that was probably not the best setup. And I, I switched, I kept the braid for a long time. And I actually just like within the last two years, cut out the braid completely, but I did get better combos. But yeah, for that first, probably like four or five months, I was doing damage with a, with a jerk bait rod with three ounce baits that had no, just absolutely no, no reason to be getting casted on that rod. I, I kind of like throwing the big swim baits on the softer rod, the treble hook baits, of course, yeah, yeah. but yeah. like you get that lockup mm -hmm. that you get the full rod bend and you just know you got them. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm sure your hookup ratio was pretty good, but casting yeah. that would be miserable. Oh, dude, it was, it was like, wow, it was like a catapult, dude. Like I, I was <laughs> like, that's scared. That's scared to the point you're going to hook yourself in the back of the head. Cause that rod just is keep loading up by the time you start to start to whip it out there. Oh. It was, uh, it was quite the experience, but yeah, I, I kind of like a parabolic rod too. Like I, man, uh, are you familiar with the Powell endurance lineup of rods? That's the blue one. Yeah. The blue one, man, Yeah, yeah. that, that jerk bait rod that they make, it's a six, it's a six, 10, four. Oh, that is my all time favorite rod. It's crazy light. And you just like you reel you reel into a fish and like you go went and it just bends all the way over and, and like that into a swim bait rod man there is nothing better than reeling down sweeping into a fish and that rod just loading up and like i don't know i like it because <clears throat> fishing how i fish like if i have to grab the net or reel down to get ready to grab grab up to flip the fish like i don't have to worry like you have some you have some play in that rod. That rod's not going to just unload and you're going to yeah. lose all the tension and stuff. That's, that's the, like the main reason I like a parabolic rod, because you can, you can get yeah. away with doing some silly stuff and that rod just doesn't unload, which is so nice. Exactly. That's why I like I, the rod I'm throwing the 250 on right now is a St. Croix. It's not even the expensive one. It's the cheaper I think the Bass X. Okay. Cause that's a little bit slower rod yeah. and it's even, it's like the, Bass X heavy that's rated to three ounces, mm -hmm. but I'm throwing a six and a half ounce bait on it. Yeah. Cause you know, once you get the trebles in them, you just see the rod just mm -hmm. bow up. Yeah. 
Dude, it's it's so nice. But so after after you go on this like streak of catching good fish, were you kind of sold on the glide bait at that point in time? Is that why you got the two fifty next, or did you know the two fifty was like a staple for California? Um, I didn't really know it was a staple. I had seen some Instagram posts of guys. I I had probably seen Butch Brown by then, and I just knew. Like I saw it up on like a fisherman's warehouse. They had it up on the back shelf. Yeah. It was like 170 bucks. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go for it. Were... I know. I mean, I, at that time I probably could have got it used for like 120 or 130, right. but I didn't even know about the black market or anything like that on swimming underground. So I just bought it straight retail from fisherman's warehouse. That's but, awesome. Do you remember what color it was? Oh yeah. There was a butch Brown bluegill, which I ended up trading and I had a fish that was, I mean, I, I was able to hold, have you seen, you've seen the cast the catch footage of Oliver Nye's 17 pounder, yeah, right? Yep. So my dad caught that exact same fish a year later. Really? Same fish. Still, still yeah. 17. I heard you had mentioned that it was still 17 when you caught yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. It was still 17. He caught it in May. Okay. So it wasn't like the full like winter time right. spawning, but it, it had the same, it had a huge gill slit. Like, you know, like a coal tag mark yeah, yeah, yeah. cut. She lost one whole like side of her gill from yeah. a coal tag. And uh, so same fish. And I was throwing that, the butch brown bluegill. And I had a follower that was way bigger, way bigger than my dad's. Really? <laughs> and yeah, I ended up trading that color. I, I got a, I have like, I don't know. I have way too many depths, two fifties, but that's one color that I want. I'm going to have to get one again. <laughs> Dude. Like, and, and for the fact that you had seen a fish of that class and kind of like know the diameters of it. And to say you had one, yep. bigger than that, that is, dude, that's insane. I don't even like, Oh, Hey, look at that car. Oh my gosh. It's large mouth bass. And it's trying to eat my two fifty. Like that's insane. That's crazy. Can't even think about that. Yeah. And that fish, like, the second I saw it, mm -hmm. it had already, you could tell it was, yeah. it knew, it knew that bait was fake. Mm -hmm. It was just following just because it was bored. It saw the boat. It looked up at the boat, looked up at me, looked at the bait. It's like, oh yeah, I know what's going on. And it, it just cruised off. The best, the best thing ever is when you have like a really, really big fish, follow it, follow it right up to the boat. And you kind of like see and turn and then they just swim right underneath the boat and disappear. <laughs> it's just like it I hate that. Puts you, it puts you the middle <laughs> fin on the way by, and it's just like, oh my god! Exactly. Like I it's can't... cool. It's cool to see a fish like interact with the bait like that, but it's not cool when they don't eat the bait and they just tease you and they just keep yeah. going. It's the worst. Yeah, I I can't tell you how many ten pounders I've seen do that. <laughs> Man, that's that, that that's just so insane. So get the two fifty. What was your first experience with the 250? Because the 250, world-class famous bait. Anytime somebody gets a 250, they go out and fish it. And the next day and a half, two days, there's a post up on Facebook or underground or Instagram. This thing I saw, I didn't even know I had that many fish in my lake. Like they all just wolf packed it. I had schools of 20 fish following at every cast. What was your, you know, like first day, first trip experience with it? I mean, kind of on par with the rest of my swim bait experience. I caught one bed fish on it in the first year and you know, I had followers, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I'd probably thrown it for at least a year. And I was like, you know what? I'm not catching any fish on it. Maybe it's the color. So I bought a rainbow trout one mm -hmm. and another like few months went by and then I caught, I started catching them on the rainbow trout, but Really, my it was a it was a really slow progression to getting fish on it. Yeah, and I think that comes a lot with boat positioning. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the main changes I had to make. Right, and like those fish weren't it wasn't virgin waters either. Like they, those fish kind of knew what a two fifty was, and um oh there was something I was gonna say you just mentioned uh, oh. In your area, do they still stock trout or like had they up to a certain point? Like, were you familiar with trout stockings and kind of using those days and in, in that time of season to kind of promote the 250 where you could for a bigger bite? Oh, yeah, we absolutely chase trout stockings. We wouldn't necessarily throw swim baits at them. We would sometimes. Really, my dad had, I can, I can remember one time when we like saw the trout truck 
and we were both throwing the like eight inch Castaic mm -hmm. and like he caught like a four and a half pounder. But like we knew the trout stockings were happening, mm -hmm. but even my first pattern you could call it on the depths 250 was a mm, early summer pattern oh, where wow. they weren't planting trout. Yeah. Dang. So what, what that was early that summer pattern? pattern is actually it's actually a kokanee pattern. Those really? kokanee get shallow in June. Yeah. Okay. That's looking back. That's that's what that was. Dang. I didn't even know it at the time. Right. So were you fishing like your 250 or do you have like a silver 250 or like your rainbow 250 or kind of how did you pick it apart? I shot this guy. Okay. This is, this is obviously a backup. Right. It's not, it's not chewed up, but just a Japanese trout. It's got a lot of flash, but it, I didn't match the kokanee perfectly. Right. So <clears throat> did you, you were on like on the forums and stuff at this point in time. Did you ever hear like the rumblings of the OG two fifties are better than the new style and like all the mods and stuff? Did you get caught up in that? Or did you ever get concerned about trying to get a two fifty uh, OG or anything? Uh, I, I didn't even, I knew about it. I knew the, uh, like the differences, the foam versus the plastic, yeah. but I didn't get that. There's my OG there you go. 250. I didn't get one until I won the swim Weed underground tournament on a 250. And then Butch sent me a couple, he oh, sent me a tune style and then he sent me an OG mm -hmm. and, uh, they're definitely like for how I throw the 250, I think the, that Butch tuned new style is my favorite okay. but the og you definitely you can like keep it cranking you can you can get that one down to like 10 feet mm -hmm. but still be like fishing it winding it in hmm. so you, you, like we'll we'll rewind a little bit so for that kokanee bite like is that mm -hmm. just simply the trout are pushing up shallow or like the bass were pushing them up shallow and you were just pretty much imitating casting up boat positioned out deeper casting shallow and just ripping them back that that pattern was a it was burning it over island tops okay so I those coconut you're probably sw they're swimming out in like 80 feet you know they're over 80 but in like you know 20 10 feet and then they'd swim they'd cruise over that island top and right over the island top is where the bass would push them straight to the surface wow so see i was thinking that those um those fish were positioning on that like 10 foot of water you know, the, on top of that island. And then when they swam off, that's when a bass was coming up to pick them off. But it's almost, it's the other way around. The bass were stationed. They're yeah. like sitting on top of that island and just grabbing trout as they'd come yeah. over that hump. Yep. They, they would sit straight. We get a lot of like, I don't know if you know what manzanita is, just like rough brush okay. in the water. Mm -hmm. And the bass just sit on in the manzanita bush and they'll blast straight up. That's where a lunker punker, I've had crazy days with a lunker punker doing the same deal at the same time. That sounds like a blast. Like I've, I've had a couple punkers. They are so fun. I had a couple wood ones and I had a couple fish swirl on them, but it's like such a unique bait for here. I'd never been able to like actually catch them on it, but did I look at it and I'm like, man, this would be awesome if I had striper in my lake or if they set up like how yep. like you're talking, like the only way I could see getting bites here is we have like a shallow flat with like toolies and just bomb and parallel mm -hmm. cast the toolies and like kind of ripping it back yeah. and forth. That's the only way I could see fish like coming up and swiping at it. But even then, like, I feel like it takes a pretty damn aggressive fish to come up and try to mess with an eight inch punker, especially a Northern strain with a small mouth. Yeah. And I noticed that fishing up in Minnesota, it felt different because the bass weren't necessarily the apex predator. Mm -hmm. Like you've got musky, musky. you've got pike Yeah, that, like I would go to like prime swim bait spots there and it would just be just de deserted because I, I think the, the bass kind of take a step back in right. terms of like sitting on the prime spots, eating the prime baits. That was just my experience on the two lakes that I fished up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's dude. It's interesting. I, while you're saying that, I kind of want to do an episode. Like I want to do a series with guys, like where we do a zoom call like this and we have like, zoom has a little whiteboard feature and I want to like pull up a contour map of one of my lakes. You pull up a contour map of one of your lakes. And like, I just want to like take a deep dive. Like, okay, this is my lake. This is how this water 70 degrees. How would you fish this? Like, what would you fish this with? How would you fish this with? That would be so cool. And I feel like guys could just get into a deep dive on that because like, like I said, a couple thousand miles apart, but your fish eating a punker from 
you know, coming from 80 foot over to a 10 foot island, that is like foreign for here. That is something that you'd probably never run across here. It's like fishing over grass pads, which I, or like uh, grass flats, which I know you guys have too, but like 12 foot grass flats and, and the grass comes up to like eight foot and you're just ripping glides over or you're fishing uh, like against seawalls and stuff with like riprap, which is kind of something that you guys probably also have out there, but just the difference, like we have a same scenario, but the situation is just completely different. It'd be super cool to like hear everybody's take on that, but man, so you guys are ripping these glide baits like back o- or back over these islands and stuff. And these fish are just coming up and T-boning it. Were you but, having a lot of problems with like fish miss- missing the hooks or anything, or were these fish just, just coming up and smacking it and getting hooks like almost every time? Um, I was throwing it on a super stiff rod. It wasn't, I wasn't throwing it on the cousins or, the, or I was throwing it on a cousins. I wasn't throwing it on the, the St. Croix or even the LBC, the white label. Yeah. That's that, that was once I upgraded to the white label, mm-hmm. I started getting hookups, okay. but I think I was actually pulling the hooks on the larger fish. Mm-hmm. I was catching a ton of like three to fours Yeah, and I was still missing them. And once I switched to the white label, which had a little bit more of a bend to it, then I was getting larger fish on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy what that like slight rod change will do, whether it's like another three inches and a softer tip, like that, like plays huge into a role of like, of like keeping fish pinned and like, and not, I mean, if you have a stiff rod and you jack them and your drags down all the way, you're just going to rip that fish's mouth apart, especially with like like if you had like S waiver hooks, like some gnarly thick gauge hooks, those things are just going to rip right out. No, no second thoughts about it. Yep. I have this not to jump way ahead, no, you're good. but this is a Chad Shad with a, I think these are ST 56s mm-hmm. for the peacock bass in Hawaii. Mm. And it's the same deal. I was like, I've got this, I've got a, I've got 80 pound braid, 30 pound mono. I'll just rip down the drag and just pull these fish out. And the first thing I did, like first five fish, just rip the hooks, pulled the yeah. hooks every time. Dude, that's insane. Did you, did you ever mess with modding your two fifties at all? Like adding flash to them or feathered hooks or like adding weight. So the couple of two fifties I've had, I've gone in depth board, but they were different. They had a ball bearing. So they like shimmied like a Senko on their way down. Yep. And I would, I would fill it with like five to six big lead strips in the, in the bill slot. And it would like, yep. it would just stay down. It wouldn't nose up whatsoever. And that was how I caught all my fish. I couldn't, I don't think I could catch a fish on a stock 250 because just a, just a uh, confidence thing. I don't know if I could do it. Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if you can see it. That one has, I think it's like three sixteenths okay, lead yeah. in the nose mm-hmm. in that slot. And then I do have one that, you know, after well over a hundred fish the skin's torn the i've hit it on top of docks and everything and it's cracked i ended up doing the butch tune where you fill it with spray foam oh yeah yeah spray foam and then reweight it mm-hmm. and so i i did that modification i haven't gotten into cutting the skin to mm-hmm. widen the glide or anything like that even my even my og where you can like switch the pins mm-hmm. tighten the pins on it i haven't messed around with it yeah it I don't know if like, I, I feel like an ABS bait. I feel like it's a little bit more of a sin to start like crazy doing crazy stuff to it, like pulling pins out and stuff. Cause I'm like, well, it's not like really resin, like plastic does have a lifespan to it. Like if I undo this thing two or three times, that fourth time, that pin just might pull all the threads out. And I might, I might be SOL with a, with a two pieces of a 250 that I'm not gonna be able to put back together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. So you're catching fish on the 250 and you're like, you're having some success pulling some fish, pulling some fish off, whatever else it may be. Did you kind of get to experiment with the rods while you were still on that bite or did that bite simmer down and you kind of had to find something else and, and kind of mess around with rods? Um, I've gotten to the point where I can get bit on a 250 just by putting the boat way up on the bank mm-hmm. on a main lake point, casting all the way out. And like, I have my specific retrieve, and I, I can get bit every, I've gotten fish every month out of the year. So, so I, after that first, like finally getting on them and getting that confidence with it, I could, you know, it, I wouldn't catch a lot. And by no means was, is it a tournament winning right every, right. you know, cause I'm getting one to two bites a day, throwing it for eight hours, mm-hmm. but I can get bit every day on it. 
yeah, that's like, I don't know. It's a fun, fun bait. It's fun to watch. It's fun to watch the fish act. I mean, in, in all reality, like outside of the Japanese having 27 inch search baits to find fish, <laughs> like the 250, if you, it, rather than pre-fishing, if you just wanted to go around, cast the docks and pull the fish and just see what kind of caliber of fish there, the 250 is a great bait for that. But outside of catching a kicker, probably not something that you're going to pick up to, to catch a, catch a five fish limit. Yeah. And even like my issue is like, you get them to follow mm -hmm. and you can only get the little ones. You can only turn the little ones on yeah. at the boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like come tournament, like I could catch five fish on it. And they'd all be like two and a half, three pounders yeah. that I like turned on. And the big one, like you never see the big ones nope. eat. Like that's so ones, rare. It's always yeah. Yeah. way out. Yep. I was about to say the big ones eat like six, five or six real cranks in. And then you have to, you have to pin that fish. And then of course you got to fight that fish all the way back to the boat. And like we were talking about earlier, they get 10 feet from the boat and they still got some spunk in them. And that's like the make it or break it time. That's like where your rod and, and drag, honestly, if you're fishing yeah. a little bit stiffer rod, that's like where those two things are like the make it or break it. If it's off by, if your drag's off by three pounds or your rod isn't loaded up enough, that fish is going to pop, like start to dive down. And when you pull it up, if you're not reeling into that fish, is just going to pop off and you're going to be, you're going to be crying. <laughs> oh yeah. Been there. Um, <laughs> so you're catching fish on the 250. You're kind of getting into the sway of things. Did you ever mess with anything else outside of like the 250, like you'd mentioned the punk, or did you ever mess with many wake baits or swimmers or anything else? Um, at that point, or like even soft baits outside of the Huddleston. Uh, it was, it, it was a while before I started throwing, like I threw the HUD a ton and caught like a couple dinks, but I started throwing the bait Smith. Mm -hmm. And then that was kind of another, the way the 250 kind of got me, the way that like the S waiver got me to yeah. that first stage and I started catching more on the 250 mm -hmm. and then throwing the bait Smith kind of got me into the soft plastic game. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's the bait Smith got me a lot of 10 pounders. I mean, I don't have a ton. I've got nine over 10 pounds, but well, that's nine more than I have. So it's a ton to me. <laughs> you got to come out to California fish like clear Lake and then some of the mother load lakes mm -hmm. and you'll at least, you'll at least run into one for right. sure. Yeah, man, that, that, that's so crazy. So after you get into the bait Smith and stuff, like, did you, what other soft baits were you getting into? Like, did you get into like the citizens or battle shads or anything, or kind of like, what was the the next step for the soft bait stuff? Oh, I've got a citizen story for you. So the first day I was throwing it, I like ran up river, throwing it on bluff walls, mm -hmm. caught like a four pounder. I was like, sweet, this is awesome. But I was having the hardest time hooking up because the, Actually, it was a battle shed. It was a seven inch battle shed. And because those spotted bass, they come up and crush it, but they've got little mouths and a seven inch battle shed where you've got it, they've got to get it in the crushers for you to hit them. Yep. And so I was just like messing with drag, messing with rods, switching everything up because I was getting crushed. It was, it was like early. It was again, it might have been that same kokanee pattern, but I was throwing it in mud lines on bluffs and stuff. But then I go down to that same manzanita structure. And I get absolutely smashed. I'm throwing 25 pound fluoro set as hard as I can and just snap the line on 25. I, I could not believe it. And then a few weeks later, I'm on that same spot. And I talked to the, uh, I talked to the local guide. He's like, Oh yeah, I got a 13 on that spot a couple weeks ago. Had a and I was like, battle Oh shot. my gosh. I, you know, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of big fish, but I, right. I have a feeling it was the same fish. Dude. Oh man. That's like, what, what color, what color battle shad was it? Oh, I don't know. It was a silver, just mm -hmm. silver top, dark silver top, light silver bottom. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. the exact color. But just the fact that, that you can come across a 13 or like you, you can be in the vicinity of a 13 pound or whether, you know, obviously, like you said, that was a fish you hooked or not, but a couple weeks later, run into a guy that said he pulled one off of that spot you were fishing. And then your mind just starts racing. Like, Oh my gosh, that was the 13 pounder. I missed. I can't believe I did that. You know, what yeah. was me type thing, <laughs> man. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's so sad, dude. I, that I don't even know. Like our, our state record here is, uh, is 12 pounds is just under 12 pounds. 
and we have a lake that has some good fish in it that might rival that. But like, if if I was to catch like an eight pounder in the state of Michigan, dude, I don't know. Like Big here, news. here it's like that's that's a really big fish, like probably one of the biggest largemouth that'll get caught in like a year, and it's like, I don't know. Like you'd have to keep that to yourself, and that would be very, very hard. That's like the the hardest <laughs> thing. Like I haven't posted any fish that I've caught this year, and it's just like not that it's hard, but it's like man, I I want to post. Like it's it's cool, it's cool video or cool picture or cool story behind it. But I'm like I don't really want to burn what we found, so it's like I I guess I'll just sit on it. You know, it doesn't hurt to sit on it. I could post it this time next year if I really wanted to. Yeah, that's that's the same deal I'm running into. Cause we're up at clear lake right now. Uh, and Danny sent me one of his new glides. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I was just getting crushed on it, but like on my best spot and clear lake, you know, there's guys fishing. It's kind of like what you were talking about with fork. You know, yeah. there's a bass boat at every gas station. There's guys, guys are on it. It's like, Oh man, I, you know, he sent me the bait. I got to I got to post the footage because yeah. the bait was getting crushed. Yeah. Or you send it or you send it to him and they're like, oh man, can I post this? And it's like, uh, yeah, go ahead. And then like, you're like, oh, well, do I tell him to not tag me in it? So nobody <laughs> sees it that I know, or like, how do I, how do I go about that? Yeah. But I mean, I just figure as long as I'm, I've got a few days head start, a few more days to like wear that bite out. Yeah. I'll take it. And the, the good news is like, if you get sent like a prototype or like a bait, that's not going to be available for a little while. Yes. Like you can replicate bites with other baits, but it's like, I feel like you kind of have the the golden ticket, like the, the ticket to the chocolate yeah. factory. Like dude, at one point in time, I was the only guy fishing like 10, 11 inch glides in out on Lake Michigan, yeah. oh, dude, it was like nine, 10, 12 fish days. And it was just like large mouth or small mouth. Large mouth and small mouth and small mouth. Like I, I was on a, I was on a two fifty small mouth bite for like about a week and a half, dude. It was wicked. It was insane. You know, you, you like the same thing you were talking about with the spotted bass, like coming up and biting the battle shad and not getting a hook. That's what it was. And yeah. you kind of, that's why I added weight into the head. So it kind of killed her down. And then I'd also run like a really small trouble hook on the head. So when they come up and head shoot it, I wouldn't yep. like foul hook them. I'd at least get one hook in the mouth. And man, it was like. Yep. It was insane. We, do you know what a bowfin is? Like a dogfish? I've caught them. Yeah. Dude, we got on I, a glide that bait. That fish terrified me. <laughs> dude, we got on a glide bait bite with those a couple weeks ago. And oh. like, dude, I kid you not, K9, like it was every cast you were, you were getting a bite. And like you were. Because they're ferocious. They're, dude, they're like an ambush to where dude, they'll like they sit. Like, and yeah, then they'll, yeah. Like they'll follow yeah. it. They'll follow. And then there's like, bam. And they just hit it. Like you're. And that canine's just shooting all the way across. And then you let it sit yep. for a second and you go to reel it. And like, you get halfway into that reel and it's like, boom, it's just like, oh my gosh. And you go to sweep into it and that fish is already gone or they've got super bony mouths. So you just shake them off. Like, and they're just like hitting it and like, they're right on the surface of the water. So you can like see their backs going crazy, man. Like we, we were on a bite the one day for probably like 45 minutes. And it was as fast as you were cast and you were getting bites. Like I had a brand new canine and this thing, is so beat up now. And of course the two oh, fish oh. I land were like pretty good pike, but like I missed one out in the middle of this spot. And my buddy looked at me, he's like, dude, that was like a 10 pounder. Like that fish was massive. You should have seen the wake on that thing. Cause he was like standing up higher than I was. And he's oh, catching on like the hoog trout and dude, it was, mm-hmm. it was absolutely insane. I was having them come up and miss the, the mini slammer. Like they were just missing the hook, like just absolutely crazy, crazy stuff. And like, that, like that's what I was saying. Like the swim bait bite on virgin waters is just, dude, it would, it would make a non-believer sell all their conventional stuff and buy swim bait stuff without a doubt in my mind. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And that's like <laughs> the, the good news is like kind of the swim bait stuff is starting to pick up here, but it's like just glide baits or like just wake baits. So yeah. nobody's fishing a soft bait, like a citizen, like casting out a citizen. So like, if you get on a bite, like if I hear they're catching them, like dragging a drop shot or dragging like a, uh, like a dark sleeper, I'll go out and I'll drag a citizen, just drag a, a citizen. The big, it's just a big version of the dark sleeper. And it, dude, it is, it is a blast. Or like the mag drafts, the mag drafts still hammer them out here. Like a big 10 inch mag draft. I had I think five or six bites the last time I went out and fished. they were all missing the hook, but I was like, these fish did not react to a glide bait, but here they are coming up and just smacking, smacking a big soft bait. And I was like, well, it's only a matter of time till I connect with one. 
Yeah. That's, that's the challenge here at Clear Lake is like, you name it, guys are throwing it. Yeah. Soft baits on the bottom, hard wake baits, mm -hmm. crank downs, everything. Everyone has every single one of them in the boat. Dude, that's like, I just cannot imagine. Cause that's kind of like the, like I said, that's like the ticket here is like, I'm pretty well versed in the game and like, I know a lot of people and I can, I can hear like a, about a lot of baits and stuff. So I kind of have the edge on that, but as far as like, like everybody fishing everything, it's kind of, I kind of have it good. Like I can get my hands on stuff that maybe other people can't or not yet. So it's like, okay, I can see if this thing works or like I, I'm scrolling through Instagram, like on the discovery page and I'll see a random video of a swim bait and like, Oh, like I know that I need to get this cause it'll work here. And I'm like, well, I can't follow the guy, but I'll, I'll, all right, I can follow him, but I can't like share it on my story or somebody else is going to see it around me. And maybe they're going to try to pick one up before I do. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of like a game of chess and, and like out there for you, there's probably no secrets outside of you presenting that bait over a certain grass flat that maybe nobody else is running past. Like that's like the thing that you can keep to yourself. Like that's like your big secret. That's, that's mind blowing to me. I mean, and even like I, currently what I think on Clear Lake is specific schools will just move through an area. Mm -hmm. Like even yesterday I was fishing and went through my best area and then like went a little bit further and I had three over five pounds, which I mean for Clear Lake, you know, it sounds insane, but it's clear like that's, that's kind of an average, like good, good start to a day. Yeah. Yeah. But another guy rolled up on what I would assume is the best spot and he caught nothing just because that school had moved. Mm. So it's like here, it's not even so much about baits, just timing that school. And, you know, maybe that school does move like depending on the moon phase or something that I haven't put together right now, I'm kind of just bouncing around hoping to run into that perfect time. Right. What, uh, like what does clear Lake set up like, like depth wise and like uh, structure and, and kind of forge and stuff. So I think Clear Lake, first of all, for forage, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that Clear Lake has more fish per like square foot of water than any other body of water on earth. Wow. Like I just got the, I just got forward facing sonar mm -hmm. and you can scan like 180 degrees Yeah. and there's 300 fish and you most of them are carp. Crazy, you just have a crazy ecosystem out there. Yeah. It's ridiculous. There's carp, catfish, and there's like native to clear like only species like hitch and then there's blackfish pike mm -hmm. minnow i mean just just on yeah, the forge crappie they, then you have all the sunfish the crappie mm -hmm. the bluegill um but it's all forage and there's it, it's so random because you'll you'll be scanning over a point and it's it's a shallow weedy lake for the okay. most part yeah they're like it's really cool actually because it, it basically fishes like a pond on the north end mm -hmm. you've got weeds you have willows in the water wow. and then you go down you go down through the narrows and because it's like it's like 20 miles long oh okay yeah yeah but you go down through the narrows and you've got vertical drops to 35 40 feet and then you go back a little further and you've got offshore ledges mm -hmm. and like humps kind of like, I don't know, kind of like what I would assume fishing, a, running a crankbait over a yeah. Kentucky Lake ledge would be. Yeah. Yeah. And then over the whole lake, you've got the whole thing's basically lined with tulies. <clears throat> so you've got everything you would want to fish. Right. Just pick, pick whatever you want to do that day and you can go out and do it. Exactly. Man. So it sounds like you said the North end was like the shallow weedy side. I mean, yep. I don't know about what lakes you fished in Minnesota, but that's like kind of what it is here. Like all our lake, a lot of our lakes are bowls. The deepest point is the middle and it's got yep. pretty much grass all the way across. That's, that's what a Northern, Northern Midwest Lake is essentially. Yeah, that's exactly what I fished. Um, the, the Bassmaster tournament, the national championship was on the Mississippi river. Okay. But then the top, the top four teams got to go to like the class, that classic fish off mm -hmm. that you watched Nolan okay, almost yeah. win. And we, we made it to that. And it was just that shallow weedy bowl lake and i caught him skipping a jig under docks but right. then i got beat throwing a drop shot for deep smallmouth on like shell beds or something yeah yeah dude that's so crazy so 
the way you're catching these fish, I'd watched, I'd watched your, your striker video from the other day. Mm-hmm. So you're just like, I don't know depth or anything, but are you just pretty much sinking a jerk or sinking a glide bait down and ripping it over these weed beds and like weed patches and stuff? Yeah, really. I'm trying to find like ambush spots to where the schools of hitch will roam. They'll just kind of roam over the weed beds. You'll see them like jump in and they'll, the schools will move, but they'll move into those kind of ambush spots yeah. and the weeds are probably a foot under the surface. That's insane. Yeah. And so I'm just running that striker shad pretty shallow over the top of them. Yeah. Do you, so if you're not familiar or anybody who's listening, um, St. Clair and Mill Lax are like the same exact lake. It's 12 feet all the way across for a hundred miles. There's a couple, there's a rock here. There's a rock there. There's maybe a group of rocks here. Those fish have no reason to stay in one spot or another. That's like, if you guys ever watch the, uh, the elite series and you're like, what the hell Seth fighter caught. 27 pounds yesterday and now he's barely scraping in with nine those fish have no reason to stay in a spot they can go wherever they want there's no deter or like there's no attracting factor to keep a fish locked into an area like where there's like a lay down on a lake or whatever else it may be is that kind of why you think those fish bounce around like because so so i always say that bass like relate to oddities like if you have one rock and it's all grass around it that fish is going to chill around the rock but if the lake is the same exact thing, cut, paste, and copy across the whole lake, that fish has no reason to sit in one spot. It can go wherever it wherever it wants, and it's going to have the same success rate, or like the same opportunities as if it's somewhere else. Is that kind of why you think those – or is that maybe a reason why you think those fish bounce around so much is because there's that grass, tall grass, like all the way across the north end? Yeah, those fish can feed wherever they want. There is enough structure to keep fish for the most part – like you have areas to target yeah. and like areas that will turn on, but also you got to deal with boat pressure mm-hmm. to where sometimes just sitting out in the middle of the flat where those fish are going to be, you know, they've all been caught. Mm-hmm. They've all been caught up shallow on the Thule lines on the Thule points and they just pull out to the middle to relax. Yeah. And then you catch them there too. Dang. So it's just, it's so random right that's, now. That's so crazy. <laughs> have you, have you um, messed around with soft baits, like right over, like kicking right over those weeds at all? Yep. I, uh, I've been throwing the a JSJ. Mm, yep, yep. I don't even know. If, yeah. The loose caboose, I was throwing that over the top. I've been throwing a lot of real prey. The real prey is the one that I caught the biggest fish of the, uh, of your tournament on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've been throwing the softies. It's kind of, it's more fun to throw like a wake bait, but, or a glide. Mm-hmm. But man, I had one, I was throwing it over the middle of a weed bed three, four days ago. And with it, I was throwing a 250 over the top and it just got that, it got one back hook and mm-hmm. I'm, I throw the, the Gamagasu round bends mm-hmm. and it straightened that hook out quick. It was like, I saw it. It was like eight to 10. Dude, eight to 10 in, in the middle of July. Like I cannot even, yeah. middle of July in California, like I cannot even fathom that fish was probably 13 pounds, 14 pounds in the spawn. Like absolutely insane. Yeah. We're, we're pretty spoiled in California. Just when you think about how many of your, of your state record fish I've seen over the last 10 years. Yeah. It's like tens, if not hundreds. Yeah. dude. And then you know? like, you got to think like Minnesota, do you know what Minnesota state record is? It's got to be 10. Dude, it's like just over eight and a half, I'm pretty sure. It's like either eight or nine and a half. Like, so so to put it in perspective, uh, we'll reiterate on your, oh, I only have nine double digits. You've broken the the Minnesota state record over nine times. That's not even counting your nine and a half pounders and to nine and a half to 10 pounds. Like, dude, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. And, and like, I will say, I think the fishing here is easier. We probably have more fish and like that fishing pressure isn't nearly what you guys have, but like you guys have 12 months out of the year, those fish can gorge, those fish can do whatever the heck they want. Whereas here, no, not as much anymore, but they only have like five months to eat and kind of gorge themselves. And then that other seven months, they are just glued down to the bottom and they barely even move. It, it's kind of surviving. Yeah. It, it's like. If we had like our the fishing, the fishing size has gotten to be kind of crazy over the last two years. Like we're starting to see a lot of like good smallmouth and stuff get caught. And I think that's because yeah. how mild our winters have been. 
like that. Did you see the New York state record just got broken a couple days ago? 12 pounds. Yeah, the 12, 12 pounder. pounder. Dude, what do you catch it on? Uh, Wacky Rig Senko. Oh, boring. <laughs> but like, like, I honestly think our last two winters have been really mild, not to like the mild of the point to where there's like, um, like, like no winter, but the water is a lot warmer and like, it doesn't get as cold and those fish can kind of do a little bit more stuff. And so I don't know, it, it's, it's like how many, how many warm winters do we need until maybe we do grow a 12 pounder in Michigan? I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll, we'll have to find out yeah. at some point in time. <laughs> um, how about that? So you touched on, uh, just kind of wrapping it up here a little bit. You touched on your, um, your, your scales and tails tournament. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, you had won the the Fourth of July tournament with like close to an average of five pound fish, which is pretty good. I mean, I would I would say that's pretty pretty dang good, pretty pretty good for for majority of the people that are fishing the tournament. We'll say that. Um, but you had also mentioned that you had won the twenty nineteen SBU uh, big big tournament, kind of. So that is. And, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's like every month they put on a tournament and like the winners of all those months face off for like the last couple months of the season, right? Or like last couple months of the year, I should say. Monthly tournament. And then in October, the 12 previous monthly winners compete for a week. Okay. Basically the same format as your scales mm -hmm. and tails tournament. Okay. Just it's one fish. Yeah. Dang. So do you remember the guys that you were fishing against? Or like, do you remember at least like one or two of them? Um, what I, I remember one of them was he's always, he's in it every year. And I think he's a Northeastern guy. Oh, um, uh, I know who you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Um, hold on. I'll look him up. I know who you're talking about. <clears throat> yeah. He's in it. And I think there's a guy from Washington that's in Darryl. it. I, I don't know his name. I'd recognize his like handle on Sweet yeah. Underground, but there's a couple, there's a couple standby guys who make it every year. Yeah. So what was that like? Like, so obviously you know what okay, what month did you win and how did you win that month? We'll start there. We'll start with the basic part of that. So I was it was in April, just like you know, prime spawn time it was a pre-spawn fish i just threw a depth 250 i was in the back of my boat in the back of the boat while my dad was fishing and i just launched it 100 yards off a point and we went over that spot later and i ended up putting the depth 250 straight in between two like standing trees mm -hmm. and it was i think it was on 1140 she just came up and crushed it was that your is that your pb that was my pb at the time yeah that's so awesome. At what point was that like early in the month? Like, were you scared somebody might beat you or was that towards the end or the middle? Um, I don't even, it was, it's just a week long. So it's a oh, week okay. out of the month. Okay. Yeah. And so I don't know. I'm pretty sure I sandbagged the way basically everyone does. You don't want people to know that they have to catch an 11 to beat you. Right. Right. So you put them in at the very last second. Um, but yeah, that one ended up qualifying me for the next October, okay. the battle for the underground. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're like, were you kind of like planning like your October, like that week in October where you're like, okay, I'm going to take the week off of work or skip skip school, whatever I have to do. I'm going to fish this place. If it sets up like this, I'm going to fish here or whatever else it may be. These are the baits I'm going to use. Kind of, Did you like kind of have a plan and an idea already in your mind on how you were going to attempt to win it? hundred percent. I, so the lake that I caught the 1140 on was like three hours away from my house. It's a lake we go camping at. It's not, uh, you know, not a lake I fish often. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, you know, planned to go back to that lake in October and it was a little bit too warm. You know, you hope that the winter and the, the fall comes early. So those yeah. trout get going, it was still warm, but they did start putting trout in the lake. Mm. And so I fished the first day, you know, woke up at five in the morning, fished for, you know, 12 hours, 13 hours. And then last cast of the day, that first day, I caught a 1040. And, you know, I thought that was, you know, I thought I was set with that fish. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
it was on like the prime spot on the lake, right? Like the offshore hump, same deal. The trout go over it and the yep. fish blast them off the top of it. I caught that one on a bait Smith Magnum. Oh. And then I took that fish, released it like three or four miles up river. Mm -hmm. First thing next morning, wake up super tired. Like that fish, that fish is actually on YouTube. There's like a swim bait Canada video competition. Yeah. So yeah. I entered it. I entered it into that like four or five years ago. That was, but, uh, uh, I think that was the year Marshall had won it with the H trap with the ball. Um, yep. Okay. That's, I thought that yep. was that year. But, uh, so I was, I was so pumped, like 13 hours, no bites, nothing. Finally catch a double digit. That was only like my third or fourth double digit at the time. And then the next morning, wake up again, like five o'clock, just absolutely exhausted and like go over. None of the graphs are on. I have one rod on deck, just still three quarters of the way asleep. Yeah. yeah. Cast the 250 over the top, get bit, just kind of reel it in, slide it into the net, whatever, pick it up, throw it in the live well. I, I knew it was a big one, but it wasn't as big as that 1040. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then I keep fishing. I hope another one rolls up to that same spot. And I was like, well, I might as well weigh it, put it on a scale. And so I do put it on the scale for a picture. And I think it was 1269. Whoa. And I'm like, I was like, I was asleep. <laughs> I, I didn't even wasn't even excited nothing just it I'll, slid I'll right box, into I'll the box net. this seven and a half pounder and I'll weigh it later take some pictures later it yeah, grew it I thought grew it was eight pounds. I thought it was eight pounds I thought it was an eight and a half to nine pounder but it was the craziest thing so I could look straight down its throat mm -hmm. because it had a two pound trout like oh, in a yeah, U yeah. in its stomach and like it literally couldn't really shut its stomach because it wasn't as big as that 10 pounder, mm -hmm. but it had two pounds of trout in it. Dude, that's crazy. So like, so going back to what I had said, like catch a big fish on a tournament and it's just like, like my adrenaline just dumps. Like, I'm just like, I'm done. So after, after you fish for a little while, like, oh, maybe I'll just scale that fish, get a picture, throw it back, whatever. You're like, holy crap, 12, six or whatever it was. Yep. Were you like, I'm going to go in and take a nap or were you like, I'm just going to sit on this point and I'm going to keep dragging baits over just in case, you know, a 12, seven comes across. I, I was pretty much exhausted at that point. Like I, I didn't catch another fish for the next, you know, I fished a whole day. Yeah. I got off the water, maybe three or four instead of six thirty seven. But, uh, I kept fishing. I, you know, my grandpa brought the RV up for the weekend so I could stay there. And so I, I took him out fishing and crazy story we i see i thought it was like a five pounder with a spinner bait in its mouth mm -hmm. and like it was struggling to swim and so i like put the trolling motor on high try to chase it down it was like a it was another double digit with like a three pound or probably a two pound trout in its mouth and it was just trying to like it was like trying to eat it and i thought it was like trying to throw a spinner bait because i saw the flash but it, it eventually did throw the trout up and so i grabbed that trout throw it over the point, like throw it in the live well, drive yeah. over to that point, throw yeah. it over the point. And it, I, I started counting and it was there for like 28 seconds. And then a bass came up and crushed it. That's like, that's like the videos you see in California or uh, of like in Alaska where those guys like uh, fillet the salmon and they throw them in the river and 10 seconds later, an eel comes up and picks it up. Like that's like same exact thing, same exact thing. Just that from a bass fishing standpoint, that <laughs> is dude, that is insane. I could not even imagine like, a two and a half pound trout and just getting engulfed by a bass. It's crazy. Yeah. They, I mean, I guess the swim baits, cause I don't, I don't really see throwing like a, like a mother chaser mm -hmm. and having that much success. Right. I think those trout, like a depth two fifty, probably swims and like has the water displacement mm -hmm. of like a 12 to 13 inch trout, even though yeah. it's only a 10 inch bait. Right. But it's like, cause I had, super wide yeah it's kicking it's it's making noise and pushing water the way a larger trout would <clears throat> dang have you messed with the tyrants yet you were describing this stuff like the whole time and i was like tyrant it sounds like between like the grass on clear lake and like these humps and coming up and, and hitting like punkers and stuff i was like i bet you a tyrant would probably go crazy there he's his his latest posts those are all clear lake fish 
Oh, really? Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, he's up here throwing it. That's I I gotta get some. <laughs> it's a crazy bait. Like I, I had one because I was holding it on for a uh for a foreign guy, so I was sending sending it to him, but like he got it sent to my house and I was just like, This ten is pretty big, but not nah, saying I don't think I couldn't catch a fish on it. I don't know. Like once you catch a fish on like uh like a, a hinkle trot or something, it's like, oh, I could fish. I could fish anything smaller than this and I could catch fish on yeah. it. We always joke we always joke that a 250 like dude a 250 is not that big it's just two 110 side by side like it's not that big <laughs> that's, that's what we always say it's like it's just a big 110 that's all it is more like it's more like four 110s in one yeah. profile yeah. but yeah <laughs> lengthwise man that's so <laughs> awesome so on after that second day or like you did you wait to submit that fish or did you submit it like thursday or friday of that week I think I waited. I didn't leave it to like last second. Um, gosh, I did miss out one year because I figured it ended at, at like midnight that day. Nine fifty nine. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, it ends at mid or 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And so I had, I had two double digits that day, but I didn't submit either of them yeah. until yeah. after. Damn. Do you know who, what second place was like after, after year 12? I think it was like an 11 something. So my 1040, my 1040 was, would not have gotten it done. There's a few guys that had 10 pounders. Is that like 10, 10 with the, uh, with the handicap, like from a, like from a Northeastern guy, was that just straight up like California 10? I want to say it was a Texas 10. So it was, it, I think there was a couple, I think there was a few 10 pounders, maybe some with a handicap, maybe, and some without, but that was, that was a crazy week of fishing. Maybe the moon set up, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, there was a bunch of big ones that week. That's like guys. Uh, there was a couple of guys who like have given me hard times in the past for the scale tournaments that I do. And it's just like, man, it's a $50 prize. It's free to enter. Like, I'm sorry, but I, I cannot run three different divisions for, for this term, like for this trade, this quote unquote podcast tournament trail that you guys want me to do. Like maybe I'll do like a East coast and a West coast version, but it's like, it's, it's just to have fun. Like it's just to, to get guys and go out and fish like over the 4th of July. That's all it was for. But like guys, like there was a couple guys who like caught like really good fish, like the top four or five of you guys all had like 12 or 13 pounds. And I was like, damn, like this is pretty legit. Like I'm like pretty content with all these fish that these guys have been catching. <clears throat> Yeah, I was stressing because the one guy, I think it was like T Briggs was yeah, his yeah. his Instagram. He had like three over four. Mm-hmm. And so he only needed one fish. Yeah. And I I dumped, I don't know, the fish here at Clear Lake, I think they're pressured. So they are really slappy. You miss a lot of fish. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I lost definitely three over six that week. I lost one over eight yesterday. They they pull hooks easy. Yeah, so he um was it you that texted me and said you lost a big one or maybe somebody had texted Could have been. Me. I tell me I don't I don't know me. if I texted you though. <clears throat> somebody or like like messaged me. Somebody had messaged me and it was like, dude, like I just lost like an eight pounder. And I was like, damn, like I, <laughs> been crazy. I think that was probably him. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Like I was like, yeah, and that, I think, I think he was in California or maybe he lives in California too. And he's like, I just lost like a really good fish. I was like, damn, like that's, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe, I think the biggest fish in the, in your tournament was my five and a quarter. Yeah, probably. So if I did, not mistaken. One, I hosted one last year. Hold on. Let me check. Cause I felt like somebody had like a crazy weight for one of them last year. Um, Maybe not. You might like, honestly. Okay. So last year we had one guy that had 14 even for a first place finish, which is, and he's like in Indiana. So that was kind of, kind of crazy. That's cool. Um, <clears throat> so we had one kid who won it. So we had three guys with over 15 pound bag. We had a guy, uh, that Cody Kirk guy I was telling you about before we'd started record, yeah. he caught 15, three, seven, uh, second place caught sixteen forty six, and then first caught sixteen sixty seven. And I was like, "Damn!" Like that was like everybody. I had like just under twelve pounds that time. Like there, like 
That was in May, like May 12th. And they're like, oh, yeah. Fish that were caught that time last year. And I was like, huh, that's pretty cool. And, and like I said, it's free. It's something cool that guys can do that have a reason to go out and fish for a little bit of competition. And I don't know. I feel like it's fun. It's fun to compete, but not necessarily like, like, like fishing a big boy tournament, like feeling like you have to do something crazy, catch five keepers. I feel like three keepers over the course of three days is pretty, I don't know, pretty lax. You go in and you catch a couple yeah. fours, there's a good chance that you can win it, especially if it's like hot or like dead of summer type thing. Like, I don't know, you can never know. Or hell, you could have you could have clocked in two nines and a ten and a half and really just set the bar real high. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that because someone's gonna do it. Yeah. If like if this gets popular enough, mm-hmm. you know someone in California is gonna have like a great weekend. Yeah. And they're gonna have 24. I mean. There was a Delta tournament I was looking at last weekend. Obviously, they probably weren't throwing the swim baits, but they had five for 35. So that's that's crazy. Yeah. That's like like a good tournament out here. Like when the smallmouth are spawning, like you'll see like 27, 28 pound bags. And dude, that's absolutely insane. I cannot even imagine. Yeah, that's nuts for smallmouth. What's your PB smallmouth? Uh, it's five ten, so nothing too crazy big. And it came on. That one was actually on a two and a two and three quarter inch tiny tube. It wasn't even on a swim bait. I never the one the the one big one I had caught on the two fifty was like crazy long, like probably like twenty three inches long. But I like I I'm pretty notorious for not carrying a scale or a board or anything. Like I have I put a bait wrap in my pocket and maybe a pair of pliers, and I just I walk. And it's come to bite me in the butt a couple times. Like there's one fish that I caught out on Lake Michigan that I think was all a six pounds, just super mm. tall fish, super fat gut, really long. And like, I remember it ate like probably about 15 feet away. And I remember seeing this fish, boom, T bones, the bait. And I sweep into this fish and like, it like did a full body roll, like with the, with the bait. And then I get it and oh, I gosh. flip it up. I flip it up and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so like, if that fish would have eaten like at the beginning of my cast, it probably would have came off. At that point in time, oh. I was fishing a 13 muse, eight to 16 ounce rod with 65 pound braid. And that was, only, that was only so I could flip these fish up and not be scared of snapping my rod or my line. But I was just like, man, like, but that was also the rod. I've, I think I lost like a seven or eight pounder right at the boat because it ate right at the boat and it did that 70 degree down and went right into the boat. And that rod has no give to it. And that line has no stretch to it. So the rod loaded up and then dink just popped off. And I was just like, Pulling I was fishing like ST 66s and just ripped right through that fish's mouth. I guarantee it. It was like pre pre spawn. That fish was on a Thule line and it was fo- like, it was like, it was like following the glide bait super hard. And it was just a, just a black ball. Like if you ever seen like a moss ball, like out in the water and it's just like g- black. Cause it's so green. That's what this fish was. And my buddy was fishing a jerk bait and he's like, Oh my gosh, that is a huge fish. And I was like, I don't think it's going to eat it. And then it like got right up to it. And ate yeah. it. Like, dude, it, I kid you not. It looked at us and it still ate the bait. I was just like, <laughs> Oh my gosh. He was like, I could not believe that that fish just ate the bait. And I, that was like, that was like the time I didn't catch my PB, but I knew I lost it. Oh, dude. I threw the rod. I was like, this is so stupid. Go drop me back off at the boat ramp. And I don't know if I ever actually told this part of the story. I had gotten to the lake earlier and I was out on the Lake Michigan side and I had had a drone and it was super, super windy. And so I went to go put the drone up and uh, the older DJI models have like an auto lift off and like, it'll hover at like five feet. I did that and it lifted off and a big gust of wind came and it blew back towards me and I stuck my hand out in it. Like it cut up my hand really bad. And so like my hand was like, oh. just, my hand was like wrapped in band-aids and like butterflies and gauze and stuff. And it was my reeling hand. And I'm like, I, I don't think that was the reason I lost the fish, but I was like, I was just not in my right mind. I was like, it was such an adrenaline that I just cut my hand open like an hour earlier. And then I just had a crazy, crazy adrenaline when I watched that fish eat. And then it was just, boom, it just dumped. And I was just like, I'm, I'm going to go home and never come back out ever again. <laughs> yep. I've definitely got the drone bite before trying to launch that DGI. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's crazy. And like, I don't know. I'm really excited. I just got an underwater housing for my big camera for my a seven three. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't even care. Like I'll, I'll bring my girlfriend to fish and she can cast and I'll just, I'll be in the water. And I just want to like get it on video of fish following these baits. Cause like 
it's something super yeah. cool that like people don't see or like just like the underwater videos of baits and stuff. I'm I'm just so excited for it. I'm like, it's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna use it all the time. <laughs> yeah, my my wife's a professional photographer. Okay, heck yeah. And so she's in she does a ton of photography in Hawaii underwater. She's got the full housing for her yeah, Canon. Yeah. I don't know exactly what camera it is, but like, but she'll do like she'll go down with like sharks and dolphins and stuff. Oh, dude, that's crazy. And I'm like, I'm like, I have to get you down to like like a lake like Shasta. Yeah. It's super clear. And I gotta throw a 250 out. Mm -hmm. And you just gotta sit down there with your like weight belt and your dive yeah. fins. And you gotta get like a, a video, like clear video mm -hmm. of a fish eating it. There's um <laughs> there's a guy, I think his name's CJ. He does he used to do a lot of stuff with lateral, like saltwater uh videos um, of like like dude great like guys coming like he'll be under and the guys will be coming up with like a tuna or something that they just speared and do just some absolutely insane underwater pictures and like i remember seeing his stuff like four or five years ago and i was like i want to get into that and i just like just now recently did like buy the underwater housing and stuff and i'm like i'm just so excited to like do, just be able to do whatever i want underwater and not have to worry get the get long fins yeah long fins like the difference between no fins and then even short fins yeah it's cool long fins you can just go down like 20 30 feet like you're in there we we did it a lot we do it a lot but once you get used to it and you get you, you practice your breath hold yeah, yeah you can go down as deep as freshwater fishing as deep as you need dude that's insane dude that would be sweet so the spot that i have like right now it's probably around like 13 feet. So literally all I want to do is just yeah. sit on bottom and just shoot straight up because like you'll get the bait and then you'll just, boom, there'll be like a line of fish just following the bait. Like it's a train or something. I'm so excited for that. Probably then a weight belt. Cause yeah. that camera housing is yeah. super buoyant. Cause like it's hard to get that thing there, down, Yeah. but like a weight belt and short fins for mm -hmm. 13 feet. Yeah. And you'd be able to do whatever you want. Heck yeah. That'd be cool. I'm hyped about that. Um, the Hawaii thing, we didn't talk about that. We'll, we'll touch on that before we wrap it up yeah. here. So you had just showed, um, it looked like a Chad Chad that you had painted like almost a goldfish color. Oh yeah. yeah that's so sweet. that's the color of a, a red in Hawaii. They call them red devils. Okay. They're basically, they're basically super angry tilapia mm. and they're like ultra aggressive. And the peacock bass, when they spawn, and they, uh, they like, you think largemouth guard their fry, mm -hmm. the peacock bass just guard it 10 times more aggressively. Really? They stick to them. The fry, like get right on them behind them. Yeah. Probably yeah. because there's so many like predators in the Amazon or wherever the peacock bass are from. Yeah. Like it's just a, a higher level of protection and aggression. And so you throw this next to a school of fry and like, you'll see a five, six pound peacock come out and just crush it. And like, I had to learn like my, the biggest one I caught was just over seven pounds and it was on the Chad shed hook it. And my drag was basically off because it's going to run wherever it wants. Yep. Even with 80 pound braid and a eight foot extra, extra heavy mega bass rod. It just, I let it run. It ran straight into a tree, pull the kayak over to it, pull up the tree it ran over to the next one and it did that three times and eventually it was just so tired. I was able to pull up the tree mm -hmm. with the bass wrapped in it. And I was throwing, you know, 80 pound braid to 30 pound mono. Yeah. And I was able to grab the bass after the third time pulling up the tree by hand. Damn dude. You said seven, just like just North of seven. Yeah. Just over seven. Dude. That's, that's crazy. Like I know that those fish just absolutely rip, but I didn't know that they, they just will do anything in their power to get away. Like I'm, whenever I see yeah. videos, it's always like the canals in Florida and stuff. So they can only run so far and guys will just like, just beef them in. But dude, that's, and, that's crazy. Do they hit it hard? Like, is it just like a boom or they just like pick it up and try to run with it? <clears throat> um, it'll, it depends. Like if you get one that's feeding, they crush it. Yeah. Just absolutely more than a large mouth will ever crush it. Mm -hmm. Just absolutely annihilate it. But a lot of them, they see you and they, they know that it's not so, real, Yeah. but they just want to get it away from the fry. Mm -hmm. And so those ones, you know, once you set on them, you've got like 30 seconds of just hanging on and then they're just so tired. They burn out quick. Right. 
Have you gotten into the largemouth fishing while you guys are out there? Yeah, I caught, I mean, the peacocks and the tilapia and the red devils and the arowana, there's so many exotic species. The largemouth are just getting pushed out, at least on Oahu, which is where I was. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of largemouth fishing on Kauai mm -hmm. and I've only, you know, and smallmouth. I caught like a two pounder. Yeah. Um, but there, there's a kid that you got to check him out. I, I think, think I know who you're talking about. Fishing. Yep. Yeah. I follow him. <laughs> I know. Dude, he caught, he caught an absolute, I think he caught a DD on the, the, or like the uh, rising sun or something a couple of years ago, or maybe it was last year. Probably not in Hawaii. Cause that would have been the state. Yeah, I, mean, I just know that it was just a huge fish. Like a, yeah, I knew he was from Hawaii and I was like, that's a really yeah. big bass. I think he fishes in, he fishes all over the place, Okay, but yeah, he's the guy, he's the guy for Kauai bass fishing. But yeah, I caught one, my biggest largemouth. Well, second biggest. I broke it later, but it was on the uh, the mini trucha mm, yeah, yeah. by Toxic, yeah. that multi-joint. I caught like a two-pounder on it. Dang. So, Maddie, when I had Maddie Wong on, he was talking about like his, his like him growing up and fishing out there. And I was just like, that's crazy. He's like, yeah, good smallmouth, but smallmouth and largemouth. No, you're fishing for peacocks. If you go out there and if you want to catch like, catch like a really respectable size fish, it's, it's always a peacock that you're going after. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to your most recent podcast. I forget the the abbreviation you had on it. Oh, but the long live that long, group long of guys. Long. Yeah, that group of guys. You guys would enjoy fishing Oahu so much because, like, you take the paddle boards out to uh, to Lake Wilson. You can catch your peacock bass. Yeah, but then there's some streams, and they're not big fish, right? But you're covering, you know, two or three miles. And you're catching a hundred smallmouth, dude. That's crazy. And you're catching them on whatever you want, you know, like top water, jerk baits, mm -hmm. little worms, chatter baits. Yeah, it's fun, and nobody does it. Like, I've other than guys that I've gone with, mm -hmm. I've never seen anyone fishing the creeks for smallmouth. That's crazy, dude. That's insane. Just like a hidden hidden treasure out there that like nobody wants to mess with because they have, they can go catch peacock if they want. Yeah, yeah, it's a blast. I mean. The peacock, yeah, I'd say pound for pound, they definitely fight harder than you get. I don't know if you've ever experienced, you probably haven't caught a lot of spotted bass. I've never caught one, nope. Okay, every once in a while, you get a spotted bass, and it's just a little two pounder, but it fights like you think it's a four or five. Raising hell down there, yeah. Yeah, you're like, what is going on? But the peacock bass fight like that fish every single time. Yeah. Dude, the videos I see, and like, I know that like guys in Florida, like they have like a hard time catching them on swim baits or like, I don't know. It's probably because they don't get as big and there might be, it, I know there's like a couple yep. different like variants of it, but like, mm -hmm. I, like, I don't know the guys, the snook guys, like they only ever catch snook on like glide baits and soft baits. Like sometimes you'll see them post up like a three pound peacock, but it's like just when they're fishing for snook, all they're catching is snook on the, on the swim baits, which is kind of interesting that, that you have like an experience of catching on the Chad Chad and stuff out there. And it just doesn't translate, you know, a couple, a couple thousand miles. It just doesn't translate to those fish for whatever reason. Yeah. I noticed that even looking at the videos of people catching peacocks, a lot of those videos are peacocks that are like on beds that they're yeah. catching in Florida. Yeah. In Hawaii, I wasn't like, I'd catch them on beds mm -hmm. and I'd catch them guarding fry. But a lot of them were just straight. You'd cast over the log, and you wouldn't even see fishing. the fish. Yeah, it just shoot out, and you'd catch it just ambush fishing. Yeah, that's like that's like what you said. A lot of them I always see down in Florida. It's always like uh, January, February, March, April is when they're getting caught, and it's like guy ripping a spinner rate over over a bed or whatever else it may be. And and I just I don't know. I always just kind of assumed that those fish were hard to catch for whatever reason in Florida. But then you turn around and say that you can blind cast and you'll, you know, not necessarily hammer them, but you'll catch them out in Hawaii. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Maybe it's something guys haven't messed with in Florida. I don't know that they'd rather catch snook in, in whatever else there is. And maybe the snook take like the most, mm -hmm. like the prime areas. Yeah. Whereas in Hawaii, that prime area has got a big peacock on it. Mm -hmm. Cause they do, those peacocks are super comfortable burying themselves like in six inches of water behind three logs that you just cannot cast to. Right. That's crazy. Absolutely insane. Have you messed with like any wake baits or anything out there? Yeah. Oh yeah. The, uh, have you, you know what the FMTC snitch is? Yeah. Is that the multi like joint trout one? The little longer one? 
Yeah. So I got one of those to take over there. Cause I, I wasn't sure what the fishing would be like when I moved out there and, uh, absolutely caught him on the waking version of that. Oh dude. And just so sick short with that one with the short lip and like small trebles, mm -hmm. you can't snag it. Mm -hmm. And so I would throw it back over those three trees yeah. and just kind of throw it like a square bill yeah. and it just roll right. over each one and it'd get absolutely hammered. Have you seen one? <laughs> I have a video. Oh, go ahead. I have a video of a five. I catch a five pounder off a of bed and I go to grab it and it puts a treble in my finger. Like I have a like ST56 yeah. in my hand and in a five pound peacock. And I just have to pop it out of my finger. Oh my gosh. That, that that's absolutely insane. Um, have you seen that fishing max frog, like with the surgical legs? It's oh. like Dude, I bet you that I bet you you could hammer some fish with that, like in that scenario you were talking about. Does that one have trebles on the bottom though? Uh, so it has. I think it has like one with the PE assist line on the actual resin part, and then there's one that goes through the legs, like through the line through part to the leg. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty cool. sure. But dude, you could like somebody. I had posted like, you guys have any questions for this guy? And somebody was like, can you take the hook and put it on the top of the bait? So it's like, it's like, yeah, this essentially. And dude, if that's the case, like you could do some crazy stuff with that bait. That's a pretty cool bait that I, I feel like uh, would probably blow up here soon. Yeah. That action is completely unique. And you take it to a lake where guys are throwing frogs, like yeah. all over and you throw that frog. That's just a totally different action. Yeah. That'd get crushed. Heck yeah, dude. Um, is there anything we we didn't touch on that we were expecting to talk about tonight? I don't I don't think so. I feel like we talked about everything. We talked about a little bit of everything, I feel like. Yeah, we covered most of it. Um the biggest bass I ever caught was a 1327. But I mean that was a pretty basic, pretty basic soft bait mm -hmm. down a down a creek inlet. Yeah. And it was eating trout. So but, was that that was after 2019? Must have been after your tournament. <clears throat> oh yeah. That one was I guess it wasn't super recent, but that was a couple of years ago. Were Were you in California during COVID? I was, and then we moved during. We moved during COVID. Okay. Well, while you were there, were you able to fish like while like COVID was happening, or no? I, I like snuck in because they closed the lakes. Yeah. <laughs> I snuck in and walked the bank a little bit, and like I caught one eight pounder. Like I found it with a 250. It came yeah. up, rolled on the 250, and I came out with a wacky rig Sanko as a follow up bait and caught it. It was like eight and a half. But I'm trying to think. Most of that time in COVID, I think I was fishing smaller ponds, didn't oh. catch any significant fish. Do you, were you guys around when they like lifted the band and you could like fish, like legally fish, or were you guys gone after that point or to that point? Yeah, we were, we were in Hawaii at that point. Dude, I bet you like when they picked that, like lifted the band, I bet you like that first probably like three days was probably pretty decent if I had to guess. Oh yeah. Cause I, I'm sure like that prime spot yeah. hadn't been hit for like a few months at least. Yeah. Those fish kind of just resorted of not having any pressure really outside of like guys fishing from the bank. Like if those fish were 120 feet off the bank, they probably never saw a bait for like five, six, eight months at a time. Like Dude, that was probably a crazy day. Everybody probably took work on that day to go out and fish. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned your YouTube. Do you like do you actively post a bunch of stuff on your YouTube channel? I don't I don't even have a YouTube channel right now. I'm okay. gonna start one within the next, you know, I got I got the boat two months ago. Mm -hmm. And so I need to start posting a little bit more significantly. Right now it's just the Instagram right. and the Facebook. Cool. What, uh, what, what's the Instagram and the Facebook for the guys who don't follow you? I think it's just my, it's my full name, Chad Everett Schweitzer. Okay. I think if you just look up Chad Schweitzer, you'll see the, the profile with all the fish pictures. Perfect. <laughs> As always, I'll tag, uh, I'll make the show art and I'll tag, tag Chad. So you guys can go follow him if you uh, don't do that already. And then uh, I'll just have it linked in the description, make it easy for you guys that way as well. Um, trying to think of anything else that uh, just anything that I want to ask you real quick before we, before we wrap it up here. Uh, well, I, I can't think of anything, but Chad was officially the, uh, the first 2024, uh, scales and tails tournament winner. You got, did you get your, did you get your magazines yet? 
No, I haven't got them yet. I would have had them out and oh, you're good. Bragged about them if I had them, but they're coming. Oh, you're good, man. You're good, dude. The shipping to California takes forever. I swear, it takes so long to get out to you guys. It's insane. I ordered a package from Working Class Zero, and it like shipped out last Wednesday, and it's not going to get here till this Thursday. I'm like, oh my gosh, jeez, absolutely, absolutely insane. What'd you get from? Uh, I got a pack of seven from inch citizens. Pretty excited. Pack of seven inch yep. citizens antenna uh, beast hooks because I don't. I have no hooks and I don't replace any hooks and I can't buy hooks here in the state of Michigan. We don't carry beast hooks or anything outside yeah. of musky hooks or like crappie trouble hooks. So I have to do all my <laughs> shopping online, unfortunately, <laughs> but already, man, I appreciate you coming on Chad. I will uh, link all your stuff in the description so people can follow you if they're not already make sure you guys, if you guys have any, any, uh, like insight on the podcast, make sure you guys shoot chat a message, tell him that maybe you learned something. Maybe you guys uh, un uncovered the secrets of Clear Lake and you guys are going to go catch all his fish or something crazy like that. But as always, Chad, I want to thank you for coming on, man. It was a super good time. I'm, I'm glad we got to talk to you. I, I'm, I'm glad you shared some of your stories. Like you're, I, I, I was really intrigued by the underground tournament. I wanted to hear what that was. And I was not expecting you to say that you caught two double digit bass in that course of 48 hours to end up winning that tournament. So that's super badass to hear, man. And uh, I appreciate you coming on and sharing that with us, dude. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was a blast. Looking forward to the next tournament. Yes. Yes. I will say um, you guys will be hearing this on Monday. So let's, let's, let's do a tournament uh, this Friday through Sunday. I'll, I'll try to get some prizes together and we'll do a tournament. I think that's like the, like the 27th through, or no, like the 26th through the 29th or something. I don't know. I'll make a post about it, but you guys are hearing it on here if I don't make a post yet. But yeah, we'll do another tournament. Maybe we'll get some bait builders to donate some stuff. We'll do something cool. But as always, I want to thank Chad for coming on. I want to thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode and we'll talk to you guys next time. See you guys.